We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. Hey, my name is Michael Miller. Notice I said Michael because we had Pastor Mike, their youth, new youth pastor, uh, appear just before me. But I'm Michael Miller. I'm one of the pastors here. And, and listen, I love to get the opportunity to, to bring the Word of God uh, to this church and this body. And so I'm excited to be up here. I will tell you, though, I'm from Texas. And some of the churches that I've been in, we do things a little different at times than uh, what some of you may be accustomed to. I enjoy feedback, especially uh, loud feedback. Not like speaker feedback in a bad way, but, you know, I, I just got done playing drums so my ears are ringing, so if y'all say amen, I'm going to need you to say it loud. Have any, have any of you ever heard of Gary Owen, the comedian? He's uh, not, not a Christian comedian per se, but there's a particular skit that I loved watching that I've seen probably a hundred times or more where he was sitting in a church that he's never been to before, and, and he was like kind of getting a feel for what's going on and people were, were amening and, and saying preach it and all kinds of stuff and the pastor was up there preaching and he's thinking I've never been here before what are they doing why are they talking when the pastor's talking and he's like looking around like these people they need to zip it I need to get to lunch <laughs> and so he's like he's thinking and then he goes oh they're allowed to talk in here and then he was like I'm gonna say something and he said he looked around and the pastor's still preaching and he goes who do who Look, I, you can say hooty who if you want, maybe not hooty who, but an amen or something, if God is speaking to you uh, through whatever I'm talking about today, it would be great. And so uh, today is part three of our series that we are going through the book of Colossians. Colossians is my favorite book of the Bible. It is one of the letters written by Paul to the church. Remember last week, uh, you learned that even though Paul was in prison, he still chose to be encouraging to the church body, and he continued to pray for them. I don't know about you, but if I were in prison, I don't think I'd be praying for anyone other than myself. I'd be like, God, get me out of here. I don't, I'm, I'm tormented right now. Like, I'd be praying for myself. Yet Paul prayed for other people continually. He prayed for the church, and he wrote them letters. On top of that, he chose to remain grateful to God. You remember a circumstance when he, when it, there's a, the, in Acts 16, I believe it is, Paul and Silas were imprisoned and they chose at midnight to worship God and to be thankful for what God is doing in them even though they were in prison. I think that's uh, hard at times. How many of you find it hard to look at life uh, like the glass is half full whenever things are, are tough, right? I, I find it hard sometimes. I have to remind myself to, to be joyful, to be thankful. You know, I tend to look at the at life sometimes like the glass is half empty. It's like the difference between someone who, who chooses water burger over in and out What I mean by is this, when you choose water, but someone who chooses water burger goes, you know, fast food is probably not the best option today or in general, but at least I'll get to eat something delicious. Now the in and out person is like, fast food's not the best option, but I'm stuck with in and out <laughs> And so you know that that's the difference. Water burger, by the way, is superior. If you've never had it, it's worth driving to a Whataburger. Have, did, is anyone, anyone wondering what Whataburger is, by the way? It's a burger spot down south. That's the best thing ever. It's fresh. Uh, but Paul was in a tough spot in life. You know, he heard about what was going on in the church, and he thought, you know, this is the perfect opportunity to be positive, to be encouraging, to teach the Colossian church something. And just to give you a little background here, you probably heard it already, uh, but Paul wrote this letter in AD 62 while he was imprisoned in Rome and he had been hearing some bad news uh, that was being taught not necessarily from the pastor of the Colossians church but from other false teachers around and like like any good leader would do he, he took that time to respond to the threats and to be encouraging to the church uh, to, to encourage everyone in the church towards their growth and spiritual maturity some scholars say uh, they, they don't know for sure what was being taught, the exact false teachings uh, that the Colossians church was up against, but they believed it had to do with Gnosticism, and some believed 
that it was uh, birthed from the Jewish synagogues and it was and, and it was paganistic beliefs. Some believe that, you know, some of those beliefs are like, if you wear a particular necklace with a particular stone on it, you can ward away the evil spirits that are around. And, and that one belief was that, that they were teaching, allegedly, is that there was a particular guy who was around that had God-like char- characteristics, and he had insights into the spiritual realm, and, and he would teach you, encourage you to do rituals and taboos, taboos, or however you say it, and rites and stuff, and it just wasn't godly things. And, and, and what I want you to, to see here is that the church of Colossians was battling a spiritual battle. Now today, the life that you are living, you are also battling a spiritual battle. There are things that happen in and around you all the time that I'll tell you right now, they're not coincidences, it's not irony, it's a spiritual battle. And today I want to talk to you about your walk with Christ and, and encourage you in three areas that will hopefully push you towards spiritual maturity uh, with your relationship with Christ and prepare you for the fight that you're in in this spiritual battle every single day. So let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer, then we'll jump into the scripture. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray, Lord, that you prepare our hearts, you, you open our, our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today, that you get us ready for this fight that we are in. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, use your word today. to to transform our lives, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, go ahead and open your Bibles, if you have them, to the book of Colossians chapter 1. We're going to continue reading in chapter 1, starting in verse 9. The scriptures will be behind me, but if you don't own a copy of the Word of God, we want everyone to have a copy. So there is a Bible, should be a Bible, in the seat back in front of you. Go ahead and grab that. If you don't own one, take it with you. We'd love for you to have that copy. But starting in verse 9, it says, So we have not stopped praying for you since we heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual understanding or wisdom and understanding. Then the way you you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. I want to pause for a moment and go back to verse 3. We talked about it last week or the week before, actually, and then in verse 8 from last week. And, you know, and I want to remind you that Paul says we always pray for you, meaning he doesn't stop. He is praying for you continually. And then he points out that the Holy Spirit has given uh, them love for others. Now, I want to make sure you understand before we get into our passage today that every one of you that has accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. And just like the Holy Spirit gives them love for others and gives Paul love for the Colossians church and all the other churches that he writes to, he gives you love for others as well. And out of love for others, we should we should be taking time to pray for them. You know, like like Paul did when he was in prison. He took time to pray for them. I think, that, you know, you could pray for someone, by the way, without totally agreeing with everything that they say or do or believe. And so, but either way, we're supposed to be praying for them. And so prayer is a huge piece of our lives, or should be at least, you know. How can you expect to have a good relationship with someone if you never talk to them? I mean, how can you expect to have a good relationship with someone and know the heart of someone if you've never taken the time to listen to the things they're saying or to be attentive to the things that they are doing? So the things that that we're going to talk about today, about what Paul prayed over the Colossians church, is not just for them, but it's for you, it's for me, it's for all of us. And, And we would hopefully take this as a reminder that we need to be praying for others just as much as we pray for ourselves. Now, the first request that God, the prayer request that, that, that God, uh, that Paul prayed to God was for wisdom and understanding. In verse 9, it says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. You know, earlier in my uh, walk with Christ, I remember a, a particular pastor, a youth pastor at a youth camp, he, told, he encouraged me to pray this particular prayer, this scripture over my life and to replace my name in it. And so I would, I would do it pretty often, actually. I, would, I rewrote it in my Bible at the time, and, it's, and I wrote it like it said, God, I ask that you give me, Michael, complete un, uh, knowledge of your will and give me spiritual wisdom and understanding. 
But outside of that prayer time, I, I would think, how on earth am I supposed to understand his will for my life? How am I supposed to understand his purpose for my life? How am I supposed to understand everything that's in the word of God? I mean, the pastor of my church, he's, he's cool and all. He's really old and he's using the King James version of the Bible. I don't understand a word he's saying. You know, how am I supposed to get this? And, and I would, you know, I, I remember around the same time I went through a 90-day discipleship course or, or class or whatever you want to call it with a, a few other uh, friends of mine and my youth pastor. And we read through five different books of the Bible. We studied and memorized scripture together. And I remember telling him, look, I know what God spoke to me a couple of years ago at youth camp. I remember that. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. At least I think I know what God told, told me my, that his will for my life is. I just don't understand it. I don't understand it all the time. And he pulled out the Bible and he showed me Colossians 2 verses 10, which we'll get to again later on in this series. But it says... So you are also, so you also are, ma- are complete through your union with Christ. So you also are complete through your union with Christ. This is why Colossians is my favorite book of the Bible. I mean, because all throughout the entire book, you will realize that when a person is, is born again into the family of God by faith in Jesus, you are made complete. You are given everything that you need for growth and for maturity. And the Holy Spirit is now in you because of your faith in Christ to help you understand things, to help you make wise choices, to help you learn and grow in your walk with Christ. If you were here last week, Pastor Matt, at the end of his message, asked everyone who's, who felt like they were called to vocational ministry to stand up. And he, he you know, all of us kind of got, got together and prayed for those people each service. But he also made a point just before that saying, and by the way, doesn't matter if you feel like you're called to vocational ministry. Every single one of you is called to full-time ministry in another regards. Now, some of you may be thinking, I'm not, I, I know for a fact I'm not called. I'm not the guy that you want standing up there on the stage talking and teaching and preaching. Uh, or some of you may be thinking, I'm not the voice that you want to hear on loud blasts on the speakers. For <laughs> Like, no one wants to hear me. They don't want to hear me two feet from me. I, don't, I, can't, I can't be the guy leading worship. I can't be the girl leading worship. But look, you have a purpose and a calling over your life. Whether you realize what that calling is or not, God has implanted something in you, and it is for the use in ministry for, for him, not for yourself. It's for his purpose. And God will reveal that purpose and that will and plan for your life. Point number one, if you're taking notes today on your note sheet, is that Paul's first prayer request was that we walk in wisdom to walk in wisdom. God wants you to know the will that he has for your life, and he wants you to understand it. By the way, the Greek word that's translated in verse 9 for the word knowledge in in, in Colossians 1, 9, it doesn't mean that you kind of know or that you you think you know a little bit. It means it, it has the meaning of full knowledge, so you fully know. God wants you, every single one of you, to fully know and understand his will for you. He wants you to walk in wisdom, full wisdom and understanding. In fact, his will for your life, by the way, it's already laid out for you here in this book, in the word of God. It's already there. If you just read it and, 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 and pray about it, God will reveal it to you. In Acts 22, verses 14, it says, Then he told me, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and hear him speak. And then Ephesians 5, 17 says, Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Look, his, his word, the Bible is here to guide you through your life. It's here to, to, to guide you through decisions. It's here, you know, we're human, so we're going to make mistakes, right? All of us are going to make wrong choices at times. But the more that you study the words that he spoke in this book, the more you're going to know his heart and the more you're going to know how to walk in wisdom. That's why Paul prayed for complete knowledge of his will, for spiritual understanding and wisdom. Like, I'm, I'm going to be up front with you and tell you, when I was in elementary school, learning was tough. I was good at math because I'm Asian. I don't know how many of you know that. Uh, I try to remind you as regularly as possible because everyone's always like, hola. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> you know, I'm from, I learned more Spanish when we went on our mission trip to Nicaragua than I did all my life. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm Asian, so I did good at math, but everything else came a little hard. <laughs> uh, and then I got to middle school, and I was like, okay, this is still kind of easy. Uh, some things, the same subjects were still hard, and math was still pretty easy. I was thriving in that. And I get to high school, and I breezed through it, not probably because I was an athlete. But still, the stuff that I actually did and turned in, I aced and did a great job. And I got to college, and it's like the half-Asian side of me wore off. 
and math was hard all of a sudden, and I was like, oh, man, this is, this is tough. This is going to take a little change in my life. I had to now become very intentionally, uh, intentional about studying and, and apply myself in a different way. You know, we, uh, it, it, I had to commit to learning all the time. It, it's, it's as easy as this. People that, that don't do it consistently, like you'll, you'll see that if you, if you don't read pretty consistently at some point in your life, you go to read a short story or an article or something, and it's going to be a little bit harder to understand than it would have been when you were doing it consistently. You know, for you to walk in wisdom, for you to go through life with understanding, it's going to take some intentional and consistent uh, time of applying yourself to it. You need to be in the Bible. You need to be growing in your knowledge of the Word of God. He's given you everything that you need already in the book, in the Bible, to understand the will of God. And I'll tell you this real quick. You understand the will of God through the word of God. He's given everything that you need for wisdom and understanding in the Bible. But I'll tell you this too. It is a walk. I'll tell you, sometimes walking seems a little easy, right? You're like, I walked in here. It was fine. Uh, sometimes it seems tough. I'll tell you, not every walk is easy. I'm, in less than a month, I'm, I'm super excited about hunting season. I bring my bow everywhere. Uh, not really, but... You know, in less than a month, I'm going to be walking through a foot or two of water and mud to get to us, like for a mile, a mile and a half, two miles sometimes, just to get to a tree to hang and hopefully see some deer. Uh, or if, you, if you're not into hunting or anything like that, the outdoors and mud and mosquitoes and stuff, you could uh, think about the Olympics. Anyone watch any of the Olympics? Those, what, I think they call it race walking or something. It's so weird. I saw it a few years ago for the first time. And I was like, what? And first of all, weird. Uh, second of all, did you know that race walkers, the people who are walking as fast as they can, they, there's a lot of rules to it, you know? That you, you have to keep one foot on the ground at all times. They have like .004 or something like that of a second that, they're, that both feet can be off the ground. But if they do it too much, then they're considered running. And so they get flagged and then they get thrown out of the Olympics. And so they practice. On top of that, their front leg has to stay straight the entire time that they're passing over uh, the body's passing over their knee. They have all these rules. And here I am going, it's easy to walk fast. I could beat them. And then I'm like seeing all these people get flagged and stuff and thrown out and, and whatnot. Or, or not very many people get thrown out, I guess, but they could. It, they talk about it a lot. They get, they get uh, points deducted and whatnot. They, these people are thinking it, this is a tough sport. I don't get it. But if, you know, Paul says, he never ceases to pray for them for wisdom and understanding because he understood that it takes consistency. It takes practice. It takes, it's step by step. It doesn't matter if it's something you do every day like walking. It doesn't matter if you're carrying 50 pounds of burdens on your back like I'm about to going through the woods. To walk in wisdom, you need to know and understand the will of God and you need to, and you know it, you learn it by studying the word of God. Now, last night I was sitting down and I was feeding our youngest baby that's in our house. And uh, God started to, to download something on my heart, and I was like, oh, I've got to talk about that tomorrow. And I told my wife, I was like, I may have to go rewrite half my message. And she was like, oh, don't do that. And I was like, well, I can't, I can't God's telling me. So, so I brought my bow. Uh, I didn't bring, I'm not going to aim it at anybody, I promise. But, you know, this bow right here is one of my hunting boats. It's perfectly set up. I love this thing. You know, it's ready for the hunt, ready for the fight, right? Now, it didn't come this way, though. This part that I'm holding, the riser and all these little added pieces on it, none of that was there at first. It was just the riser. It came in a box. The limbs, these little quieter things, what I forgot what they're called, the, uh, the bow string, the arrows, the quiver, the tab that I used to shoot, everything came separate. I had to take time to, to research every, bit of, uh, every piece of this to understand fully how it works and how it works together. Even the arrows, the arrow weight, the spine, like everything, the broad heads, the, the tips that, you know, the sharp parts. I had to understand everything. I had to know how it works and how it works together. And every one of these pieces, it took time of research and preparation. And then it took, on top of that, it took time, uh, you know, I, I was... I, 
I had to learn how to shoot it. I had to learn the correct form and get used to that. You know, walking in wisdom and understanding, it takes time. You need to, to be in the Word of God. You need to be reading it consistently. You need to be talking to the right person. Like, I had to ask some friends saying, hey, I just watched 20 hours of videos and read all the manuals on this and all these different articles, but I still don't understand this thing. Can you help me, can, can you help me understand it? It's the same thing. You need to be talking to God, saying, God, give me the wisdom. Help me understand what you're saying in your word. And then allow him to speak to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to to guide you in that. And once you have the wisdom that you need, you're ready for Paul's second prayer request that he prayed for the church. And that's to walk in obedience. That's point number two today is walk in obedience. His second request when he prayed for the Colossians church was for practical obedience. And if I had... If I had a guess, I, I'd probably say that at least 50% of you were probably like, oh, obedience, that word, okay. You probably had to cringe a little bit, maybe hid your facial expressions, because a lot of people come to church and, you know, they want to feel encouraged, they want to feel motivated, they want to leave feeling good and ready for the week and full and charged, but a lot of times they don't want their toes stepped on, they don't want to, they want to be told they need to be obedient, they know they need to be obedient, and they know there's something God's put on my heart that I need to do, and now I'm hearing this word obedience, and so you got to hide your face, you know. But look, knowledge and obedience goes hand in hand. When you walk in wisdom, your daily life will be affected by it. You need to be obedient. It's great to learn all the time. I tell people constantly, it is the, you need to be a lifelong learner, but it's important to that, that what you learn, what you are reading about, what you're researching, that you put it in action in your daily lives so that you, you know, I've heard it said, you don't want to become so smart that you become dumb. And so you need to apply what you learn. I, I was having a conversation last Sunday about music theory with someone, and I remember in this uh, conversation, we were, we were just kind of talking about how you can study it weekly, daily, you know, monthly for years, and you never fully understand what is you know what this music theory thing is i mean you, you can understand a lot of it but the, the fact of the matter is it's theoretical when someone gets a little bit more creative a little bit more theory or you know theory behind stuff is produced a little bit more so you know but at the same time when you think about the word of god the word of god there's a lot of stuff in here it could take forever to read it if you really want to i, I did learn yesterday from someone at a conference that uh, if you read 10 chapters a, a day you can read the entire Bible in four months. That was pretty cool to know. But the Bible, every single thing in the Word of God is practical. It's not theoretical, like music theory. You know, Warren Wiersbe is a, a theologian that wrote a commentary, and he says this. He says, two words summarize the practicality of the Christian walk, of the Christian life. It's walk and work. And there's a sequence to it. First wisdom, then walk and then work. And you cannot work for God unless you're walking with him, but you cannot walk with him if you are ignorant of his will. You need understanding of the word of God. It's like you need understanding of the bow and the arrows and every component before you're ready for the hunt. Colossians 1.10 says, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. I remember I said it earlier, that uh, this is a walk that we are on, and not every walk is easy. But when you're born again, when you choose to accept Christ into your life and have faith in him, there are some choices that have to be made. You know, your life should not look the exact same as it did before Christ. Your life should not look the same as people who have not been transformed by the love of Jesus. When you put your faith in him and you choose to surrender your life to him, there should be a pretty radical shift. Now, some people have this thing happen in their hearts when they, when they make the decision, and it's like their life completely turned 180 degrees right away. And some people, it might take a lot longer, it might look a lot different for that fruit to show and, and grow in their lives. But I'll tell you this, as an ambassador of, of God, as a son and daughter of Christ, a soldier for God, you should pursue living a life that is worth of your calling, that's worthy of your calling. It says in Ephesians 4.1 that you are called by God. Every single one of you was called. Now, you may not know what your calling is. You may not know what your spiritual gift is yet. You may not know everything that is in the Bible, but you can leave here knowing today that you're called to walk in obedience and, and to live a life that honors and pleases God. 
And when you do that, you're going to begin to see this, the this fruit of the Spirit evident in your life. You're going to see that it's easier to treat others with love. You'll experience real joy and peace. You'll have more patience. All the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in your life. Look, all because you were obedient to God. Your obedience allows the Holy Spirit, the room that he needs, to move and change you from the inside out. Your obedience is you getting up for the walk, for you to, to get in the fight. God, God does the rest. God is the one who transforms you. You can't do it yourself. Philippians 2 says that God works in you and will give you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Now, as you're obedient and allowing God to work within you, like Colossians 1.10 says, you will learn to know God better and better. You know, many of you know this now, but uh, my wife and I started fostering this year. We, we, uh, last Sometime in the fall, we decided, we, may, we, we accepted the calling uh, or the challenge to become foster parents. And so this year, we've had a placement pretty much every, every day of the year almost um, since January. And, and we've loved it. We have four kids now, three with diapers and um, one an infant, and so it's, we stay busy, and we stay pretty tired, um, but in all of that busyness and tiredness and stuff, uh, or exhaustion, whatever you want to call it, God reminded me of a conversation that I had uh, with a man who's in this room actually right now uh, at our men's retreat last year in the fall, and he encouraged me. He said, hey, I want you to pray about something. I want you to pray about uh, using the the, the the things that you love to do, all these things that, you know, you like to hunt and fish and all that stuff, using those things about the outdoors and adventures to, to mentor and disciple young men. And the conversation certainly stuck with me. And as I, try, I tried for a few months, I was praying about it, and I was like, yeah, I think this would be cool. And I started trying to figure things out on my own, and every time things kind of fell apart, and I was like, this, this obviously is not the right time. So I just kind of hung it up on the shelf. I said, forget it for now. Um, but then just a few months ago, the thought kind of slipped back into my head, and, and I started to pray about it again, and I got this, like, really burning feeling that I needed to do something. And, and God should have told me, you need to be around men, and you need to disciple. That's just two things that I haven't really focused on the last few years. And I was like, okay, that's it. So I, I met up with that, that same man, and I was like, hey, I want to talk about this some more. And he encouraged me some more. And then I met up with a few other guys, and they were all, like, like super pumped and excited. And they were like, let's do it. I want to be a part of this. You know, one thing after another started to fall into place. More people were getting interested in talking about being a part of it and, and stuff. And, you know, God even put the name and the vision of this whole thing on my heart and told me that I've been preparing for this for years. He's like, I've been, you are ready for this. Now it's the time. It, it's time to do this. And so, you know, it's going to take time to get into a rhythm. It's going to take time to, to figure things out, you know, have to experience stuff and change things and whatnot. But it's not always going to be easy and perfect. But, but listen, God is, has never called you to perfection. God's called you to obedience. And, and I, I said, God, I'm, I want to obey you. I want to be obedient. When God is asking you to be obedient, we have to remember that he, he wants you to also do things with excellence. So that brings me back to this bow and arrow setup here. You know, once the bow is set up, you have an understanding of how it works. That doesn't mean that you're fully equipped for the hunt or for the fight. Now that it's set up, you need to learn to use it, right? So you have to take time, shot after shot, till, till you get it right, till you get the form right. You know, there's a certain way that you're supposed to pull the string back to a certain point. You're supposed to have it at your anchor point every single time, the same exact anchor. You never let go without an arrow in there, by the way. It'll blow up the bow. Uh, all of those things, when you're under pressure, you know, shooting at targets is way different than the hunt. But it takes time to form the habit. It takes obedience. Knowing and doing are two separate things. I mentioned that earlier. Wisdom and obedience go hand in hand, right? So when you are obedient, it's like each shot is preparation for the next. Each mistake is practice for the next shot. Each failure prepares you for the victory. Knowing the word is great, having it in your heart and ready for use is important, but there's more to it than that. You need to sharpen the arrows. Let me show you one of these arrows real quick. I love these arrows because they're easy to find because they're white. Uh, but these broadheads, these tips right here, they are so sharp that one little swipe at your skin, you're gonna be bleeding. Uh, but I remember when I got them, I, I watched 
15 to 20 hours at least of videos on how to sharpen a three blade broadhead. And on top of that, I went to my friend's house and I was like, bro, can you help me <laughs> sharpen this? I, I watched it, but I don't know if I could do it right. And, and so he helped me with it, of course. And, but you need to sharpen the arrows. You, need, you can't go out into the woods with a dull arrow point, a dull broadhead. It'll hit the deer and fall right down. It might make them bleed a little bit, but you, you can't do that. You can't hurt the animal. And, and you know, there, there's a purpose behind a hunt. It's an ethical way to do it. But your arrow's not being sharp. It's like living with doing things without excellence. It's like you do it halfway without excellence to the Lord. That's Paul's third prayer request for you, is that you would learn to walk in excellence. Walk in excellence. Excellence. You remember the passage that we read, Paul prays that you live a life that honors and pleases the Lord. To live a life that is honoring to God and that is pleasing to him, we need to walk with excellence. He calls us to excellence. We will eventually get to Colossians 3 in this series, but I'll read Colossians 3.23 to you. It straight up says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. You know, there's so many scriptures that, that talk about the spirit of excellence. The first part of Colossians 1.11 says, We also pray that you'll be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. Look, 25 years ago, I'm over here waving this arrow around like it's not going to cut me any moment. 25 years ago, I remember I was learning how to play guitar, and I was learning pretty quick. I was, I was like powering. I carried it everywhere I went, and I was learning as fast as I could. Uh, about a month maybe into learning, my youth pastor was like, hey, why don't you play with us in the youth band? So I went up there with my really uh, you know, cheap acoustic that my mom had. Maybe, I don't know if it was cheap or not, but it wasn't what I needed. And I started playing with the youth band. Three weeks into it, he handed me his guitar, which I thought was phenomenal at the time. Now I'm, I laugh at it, and it's called Novation, if you know anything about guitars. Now I'm like, that's, that's cheap. I don't like those at all. But anyways, he handed me his guitar, and I was like, oh, what am I supposed to do with this? And he goes, I want you to play tonight. It was like three weeks into me playing with the youth band. And then he starts walking off the stage. And I was like, Pastor Brian, where are you going? And he goes, he literally said, you got this. Remember excellence, something that he's talked to me about for, for a couple years already. And I was like, what does he mean by that? <laughs> And he walked off the stage, and the drummers start counting us into the first song. And I'm like, I'm the only guitar player up here right now. What is he doing? That was my third week on the stage. What am I supposed to do? And he just, he looked at me again, he winked at me, and was like, he mouthed the word excellence to me. And I was like, all right, this is it. He just threw me into the deep end. And, and you know, it stuck with me, this whole concept of doing things with excellence. Within a few months, I started playing with uh, the adult band, and then I was leading the youth band, and then I was playing with other bands and stuff, and I was having, it was, it was a great time, but I say all this to say, you know, today, I'm doing exactly what God's called me to do because of the spirit of excellence, because of the, de the desire to do things unto him, you know, to this day, anytime I am the slightest bit interested in something, I will, I will run, I mean, I will, get on YouTube and watch video after video and I'll look up other articles and I'll read, I'll, I will research everything until I, I can, until I know that I'm confident in every corner of it, every aspect of it. And it, some people would say, oh, you have a good work ethic. I'm like, no, actually what it is, is I want to represent Christ well with everything that I do. I want to do things with excellence because that's what he's called us to. You know, we grow in our relationship, with, as we grow with, in our relationship with Christ, we need, we need to be obedient, and we're, when we are obedient and serving him, our character should reflect that, and the fruit would show, and part of that is excellence. In verse 11, it, it says, when Paul says you will be strengthened with his power, by the way, he uses a, a, two, a, a particular Greek word that has two meanings, and it means inherent power, power and also manifest power, which means that God wants you to understand that when you get power from him, uh, you get power from him when you put your faith in Jesus, but you also manifest power in your life. It'll show in your life. Let me tell you by experience, you're going to need his power to endure the world that you live in today, to endure everything that is around you today. I'll tell you a story. Uh, just a couple, I think it was two seasons ago, two hunting seasons ago, I called up a friend of mine and I was like, hey, um, where do you think I should hunt? It was muzzle loader season, you know, black powder. And so I was like, all right, so... I need a good spot. I'd love to be around the muzzleloader guys that are missing their shots. 
so that I can capitalize on it, right? And so I was like, where should I go? And he gave me a good spot. And I went and I had, it's a place you have to register and check in and all that. And I went and I checked in. It was like 5 a.m. It was pitch black out, had a headlamp on. And I was like, cool. He told me I needed to park right here. That's the only parking spot that I, like you had to park there before or else they'll tell your car. So I was like, all right, I parked my truck. I got out and I was like, I, I guess I just walked through there. So I, I walked over this little hill, started walking. I was getting cut up by thorns, stuck in brush. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm so mad at him. I was, I was super angry because I was like getting, my clothes was getting cut up. I finally got through it. I get to the tree. I climb the tree and I'm sitting there and, uh, you know, all day I decided I'm just going to, I'm just going to hunt all day because that was a tough walk in. But I didn't expect to do that at first. And so I didn't have food with me, no snacks. I didn't have anything but some like 32 ounces of water and that was it. So I was, it was going to be a pretty tiring day. So I sat there. I pretty much squirrel watched all day. There was no deer. I was pretty convinced that there wasn't a single deer in Maryland that day. They all migrated somewhere else. But I, I you know, I, I was, I, I was out of patience at this time. It was, it was dark again. I was like, all right, let me go home. So I, I got off the tree, packed up my bag, put everything on. I was holding my bow. I turned my GPS on, had my headlamp on. That was the only light. Moonlight, there's none of it. I mean, the clouds, whatever it was, there was absolutely zero light except for my headlamp and the GPS. But the GPS does not show you thorns and brush. So here I am walking out pitch black. At first I started walking. I walked like was probably 200 yards and realized I was going the wrong way. So turn around, started going the right way. At this point, I'm exhausted. I have no energy because I have no food in me since the night before. And I'm like walking, following the GPS. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm, pushing my way through thorns and brush again and I'm like oh this stuff again and I'm I know I'm near the truck kind of I'm not that close but I was close enough to be excited about that and but then I was so caught up I couldn't step forward I couldn't step back I couldn't step either either way I was completely stuck the only thing I could do was drop to the ground so I fell to the ground and I literally thought this is it this is where I die and I sat there for like 40 minutes, maybe more. And I was just like, I was just mad. You know, I was, I was cut up. I was beat up. I was exhausted. I was hungry. But I started to think, I, I literally started to laugh out loud. And I went, God, well, I don't know what to do at this point. I can't make this. I can't make it to the truck. And he reminded me of the scripture that we just read. Strengthened with his power and filled with joy. And I thought, you know what? He's right. I have an amazing family at home. They let me hunt all day without complaining. I'm sure they got food waiting for me. I need to get home. And I stood up, and at this point, I had enough energy, and I busted right through all that. I mean, I had major cuts on me all over. But, like, I get to the truck, and I'm excited to be at the truck. I put my stuff down. I, I turn the truck on, and, and I start to warm up. It was 30 degrees out all day. Turn the truck on. I start to warm up, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just, like, thanking God for getting me through it, thanking for the energy and all that, just the, the time I got to spend with him, you know. But I've thought about that day multiple times since then, especially in August because it's one month till hunting season, you know. But I get, I get reminded every time I think about that of the way the world is around us today. You know, every single day, the enemy is out there trying his best to wrap you up with thorns, trying his best to get you caught up and turned around in the brush to get you to think negatively, to get you to, to lose hope and to give up, trying to get a hold of your mental health, to get your, your focus off of Jesus, and to try to get you to stop being obedient and stop walking in wisdom. Y'all, it's important that we stay joyful and, and thankful to God in all things because he's the one who gives us endurance and the strength that we need to fight when things are tough. He's going to give you that strength to, to battle through the anxiety and the depression that you may have. He'll give you the patience that you need to endure suffering. By the way, Romans 5 teaches us that suffering produces what? Perseverance. And perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. We can't lose sight of Jesus because he is the hope for the hopeless. And the, pa the patience that Paul was talking about here, we need that patience to endure the race that we're running, this walk that we are on, this, this, this fight that we are in. Church, we need to be praying this scripture over ourselves and over others. We can't allow ourselves to become complacent. We need to continually be walking in wisdom. We need to be walking in obedience, and we need to be walking in excellence. The rest of verse 11 says, May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father, 
he has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. I've always told the worship and creative arts team that this particular sentence, I say to them often, and I think I've said it to the church a few times too, but the, the quote is, choose joy and let your face know you chose it. Right? Choose joy and let your face know. You can tell that to your, some of your coworkers or something. But we need to choose to be joyful. It can be hard at times when you're tangled up in the thorns of life. It can be hard when things seem to be falling apart every which way that you look. But you can choose to be joyful and be thankful to the Father. Remember, the, remember this. When, when you put your faith in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit living in you produces fruit in your lives. Joy is evident of our walk it's evidence of our walk with Christ. Thankfulness is how we express our love to the Father for the work that he is doing in our lives. Church, we end every service by asking him this simple question. I want you to ask this question yourself. I want you to ask, what now, God? What's next? Listen, if you're sitting in this room, if you're watching from the lounge or you were online, I want you to, I want you to examine yourselves for a second. So do me a favor and close your eyes. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Are you walking in the wisdom of God? Have you gotten all those, the pieces of your bow put together and, and you understand what each thing does, in other words? Are you walking in obedience? Have you taken the time needed to not just learn to shoot, but you've practiced, especially under pressure, because it's different when you're under pressure? And are you walking in excellence? Have you made sure that your arrows are sharp? And when you let it fly, it's going to do the job intended. It's not going to just hit the target and bounce off. Look, you might be in a season of life where things are just tough and it's hard to see the glass half full. It seems like every time you fill up, there's a new leak and you're just draining from all sides. You might be in a season where you, you realize you have all the pieces, but you look down and your bow is taken apart. You have the Bible, you read it, you go to church you, you, on Sundays, you know, you spend time in worship. But for some reason, when you get under pressure, you're in the middle of the fight. You look down and your bow is spread everywhere and you don't even, you don't know what to do, how to get it together. Maybe your arrows aren't sharpened for the fight. But there's three things that you can do to make it through these times and to be ready for the fight. And that's to pray for wisdom to be obedient to his calling, and to be thankful to the Father. If you do these things, it won't be long before you will experience the joy of the Lord and you will experience being strengthened by him. You'll start to notice that all the research that you did, all the practice that you did, all the preparation you've, you've done has gotten you ready to draw the bow back and ready to let that arrow fly in the fight. So I wanna ask you, this question, if that's you today and you feel like you, you just want to give up maybe, but, but now you feel like I need, I need to be walking in wisdom. I need to be obedient. I need to do things with excellence. I want you to do me a favor and stand up. Really, as Christians, as people who are, are called to do life in ministry, telling people about Jesus, that should be every single one of you. So why don't we all stand up, actually? And I want to pray the prayer of Paul over you and over your lives today. So I like every single one of you, when you get standing up, to take your hands out and just pour, put your hands up like this and then flip it around. Flip your hands out. Now, this just simply symbolizes that you are ready to receive something, like you're ready to carry the load. God wants to pour this over your life. He wants to pour the spirit of wisdom and understanding into you. He wants to pour the spirit of obedience. He wants to pour a spirit of excellence all over you. So go ahead and close your eyes. I'm going to pray this over you today. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray for everyone in this room watching online or in the lounge right now that you would fill them with knowledge of your will, that you would fill them with wisdom and understanding. Holy Spirit, guide them to living a life worthy of you that's honoring to you and pleasing to you. Let the fruit of the Spirit be evident in their lives. God, I ask that you strengthen them with power, your power and your might. God, that you give them endurance and the patience that they need in their lives. Give them a passion and a desire to do all things that they do with excellence unto you. I pray that they would, be, that they would live full of joy and thankfulness as you do a work in their lives and through their lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. 
You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.